Welcome Hasklings. I have a lot prepared for today's retrospective, so let's jump in. We're going to revisit this summarize function from day 7, and we're going to generalize it further by actually changing the representation of our DAG into a list of nodes and a function that represents the edges. This way, the summarize function doesn't impose on the caller how the edges are represented. We can also note that the summary type can actually be a different type than the edge value type. Let's update the way we're calling summarize to reflect the changes. If we map first over our bag list, we just get the nodes from the bag list. In order to create an efficient implementation of the edge function, I'm going to create a map from our bag list and then use the map lookup function to get the edge list for that node. We still need to update the implementation of our summarize function, so let's do that now. The DAG is now replaced with a tuple of the nodes and the getChildren function. We simply replace DAG, in this case with nodes, and we need to actually, instead of mapping across these Ys, we need to get the children instead. Let's rename this to N to represent the node we're, we're testing, and Ns to be the nodes that we have in our set already. We simply get children on N to get the edges that we're interested in. We need to do the same thing for the add function. We need to replace the b, y's in the input with n, and then get the children of n like before. It goes without saying that I've made a few errors, and I forgot to change the x's to n's here, and the b here to n, because we changed the names of the parameters of those functions. We're getting the same result as before, so I'm happy that we can move this summarize function into our advent of code module, and we'll pop it at the bottom here. The implementation, I feel, is still a little bit rough, and I would prefer to rename some of those internal functions to summarize, but we'll leave it for now. We're using cat maybe, so we need to import data.maybe. We can also import data.either, as suggested by Caustic. Let's also export those modules. Now, data.either actually includes the writes function that we implemented ourselves before. This is often the case where you implement a function and then find that it's actually in the standard library. So as you can see, writes is in data.either, and it does exactly what we want it to do. Talking about the writes function, we've actually been using it to do something actually quite bad, and that is throw away the errors that we might get from parsec. So I'd like to actually create a new function called parseList, which is going to parse our list of strings as given by the lines function. And we're going to output just a list of the values that we're interested in. However, we're going to crash if we get an error from parsec. We are going to achieve this by first mapping a parser across each string in our list. This will give us a list of either types, and we want to then do something with each of those either's. And we can use a function called sequence, because either is a monad on the second value. That means that if we give sequence a list of either x, y, in we our get case, back x is a parser, and either of and y x is the of output y. of the parser. In which case, we're going to get back either the first parse error encountered or the list of successful parse results. Now, doing a sequence of a map is such a common thing that we have a map m function that does exactly that. We still need to take our either value and either crash if it's a left value or return the right values. So we're going to use this either function, and it takes in two functions. The first will be what's applied if it's a left value, and the second will be applied if it's a right value. We combine error with show to crash with the parser error message if we get a left value, and id just to return the unchanged list. Let's update all the modules where we could use this. We're going to replace the writes map parse combination with just a call to parse list. 
This is a great improvement because now we'll find out if we write a parser that has an error. We're going to end up in our day eight solution, which is where I want to be because I'd like to show you how we can use the state monad to re-implement this function. There's not very much to the state monad, but it's often used in combination with other monads using monad transformers. Instead of passing these three values to the exec function, we're going to treat those as a state. The state monad provides a get function, which fetches the current state. Because we're in a do block, any value needs to be either a do block itself or wrapped in a return, which is what we do for our left return value here. In a do block, let can be used on its own to give names to certain values. Let's change this around a little bit because in the nothing case, we're going to return right as before, but in the just case, let's split that up into its own case so we can do the recursive call to exec in a slightly different way. We're going to update the state by using the state function put. The type that put accepts must match the type that get is returning, which in our case is a tuple of the accumulator, the instruction pointer, and the set of instruction pointers that we've already seen. Once we've done that, we can simply call exec in a recursive way to go to the next instruction. Naturally, we have to change the way we're calling exec, and fortunately, we have a function called runState that we can use. Given our exec function and the initial state, it gives us back the end state and result. Our initial state is simply the tuple of these values. Because run state returns us a tuple, we're going to use case to split that out. I'm going to change the return type of exec to return a boolean value because we can actually get the accumulator from the state. We're only interested in the accumulator value in the case where we don't loop, so we're going to change the output of f prime from an either type to a maybe type. Okay, so we need to return true in the case where we loop and false when we don't loop. Now that we've changed the output type of f prime, we need to change f as well. First though, I thought I'd mention another way to do this strange guard. And instead of doing the guard there, we could actually just filter out all the writes in this way. However, now that we're returning a maybe value, we can use cat maybes instead. Let's try compiling that, but we have an error because we still need to import the control monad state module. That's now compiling, but giving us the wrong value because exec is returning true when we loop and we want the condition when we don't loop. So that needs to be false and that's now giving us the same value as before. Day nine is another maths type problem and it's somewhat similar to part one of day one. We need to roll through the list starting at element number 26 to see if it can be expressed as the sum of two of the previous 25 elements. After a quick look at our input, we're going to start in the same way as we have done before. Firstly, by importing our advent of code module and then using interact to grab the input. Each line is just an integer, so we can use map read to read in that integer. If we give a type signature to our f function, we don't need to give a type signature to read. Our stub function is compiling, so let's move on to the solution. We need to take the first 25 elements and then the rest of the list, and we pass those to a function which takes those two lists. We need to check if y can be expressed as the sum of two of the x's, so we'll write a t function to do that. If it can, then we move on to the next element by dropping off the head of x's and adding y to the end. Otherwise, we just return y because we're done. The t function is very similar to the function from day one. We take the head of x's, x, 
and we see if y minus x is in the tail of x's. Now that we've filtered those results, we can test to see if there are any items in that resulting list. This is actually the same as using the lm function. If none of the tail can be added to x to get y, we simply use recursion to test the rest of the x's, otherwise we return true. If we get to the end of the list, we return false. That should give us our answer, so let's check that. And indeed, that gives us the first star for the day. The second part for today involves finding the sum of continuous subsets of our list. We start by copying the code from part 1, because the output of f is actually part of the input to our new function, which we can call g. g is going to have the same type signature as f. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to call f on our list and call that n. We need to write a function that's going to extract the subset of our list that sums to n, and that function will be called h. Once we've done that, we can add together the maximum and minimum of the sublist. Once again, I'll start by trying a fairly brute force method and that is to get all of the possible sublists of x's and test to see if they sum to n. We can use the inits function from the prelude, which gives us back all of the initial parts of a list. We can then map tails over that, and tails does something similar. It gets all of the endings for a given list. Because we end up with a list of lists, we can actually use a function called concatMap, which will concatenate together the result of that map. As the name might suggest, concatMap is the same as doing a concat of a map. Now we can use filter to grab all of the lists that sum to n. There's probably only one result, but in any case we only need one result, so we call head on that list to get the first matching subset. After fixing that typo, let's check our result. And I'm glad to report we have our second gold star. Until tomorrow, happy Haskelling!